Welcome to Break Everything. Your host, Lisa L. Levy, will guide you through critical thought conversations and a journey of directed disruption that makes a difference. Experience bold conversations with industry leaders who are willing to challenge the status quo. Welcome to another episode of Break Everything. Today, we have with us Dr. Shannon Decker. She is the principal at VBC1, a consulting firm assisting physicians, groups, health plans, and vendors to maximize the performance of their value-based contracts and offerings. Dr. Decker has more than 20 years experience in healthcare and has most recently led teams in risk, quality, data and analytics, telehealth, COVID response, and the delegation compliance. With more than 20 years of experience, She is a wealth of knowledge and information. She also, she holds her PhD, two MBAs, and two masters in education. So I'm assuming you understand why I find her interesting and have invited her to this conversation with us today. Thank you so much, Lisa. So glad to be with you today. Shannon, welcome. I do the really quick flyover introduction to set up your your credibility, right? Your background and your credentials, but that's not what's really interesting to our viewers and our listeners. I would really love it if you would tell your story, tell us about your journey and how you come came into the field of healthcare and what that's brought you to today. Sure, absolutely. You know, I think um, uh, it's interesting because I think much of my life has been one big serendipitous moment. Uh, just being at the right place at the right time. And I was a high school teacher. I was teaching ninth, 10th, and 12th graders English and history. And I entered into a conversation with a healthcare executive on a plane. Um, and, you know, we were just talking and um, I was sharing with him that uh, in my PhD studies, I was looking at learning and motivation and how do you get people to do the things that you want them to do? And he said, you know, Uh, we have similar problems in healthcare. And I think that your experience um, would really be appropriate. Uh, And having a passion myself for healthcare, you know, having uh, family members and even myself go through um, some pretty challenging times with with health personally, um, thought, you know, uh, I might be able to lend my skills here. And so really thought, uh, thought it was a good fit, got into it and absolutely loved it. Fabulous. And what's brought you to today and what the role that you're in, what drives you in in this role to make a difference? You know, I think uh, I I really see an opportunity. um, And again, it's it's that same uh, journey that I started on 20 years ago of how do you continue uh, to close the gap? Um, You know, you have patients that need care. uh, You have physicians that are trying to do the right thing, but they're so overwhelmed. And so in what way can I lend help to closing the gap, um, I think is really important. And I I still think, you know, the the same journey that I started on 20 years ago, you know, it may have changed some, the landscape has changed uh, quite a bit, um, but still the the need is still there um, to traverse those gaps. Absolutely. And for the sake of starting your career as an educator, ninth, 10th, I mean, wow, <laughs> that, that's a, that's a challenging age range to work with. And, and, you know, pardon my sarcasm, but it probably prepared you well for the industry where you're spending your time now. <laughs> I have the news for you. So I, I've taught college too. I still, um, I still work with uh, doctoral students, but I have to laugh. Um, children far easier than adults. Uh, they're much more malleable. You know, you can get them to think differently. I think uh, as adults, especially as highly educated adults, and I work a lot with physicians or even, you know, people that have uh, senior citizens that have uh, learned their way through the world. And uh, a lot of times, you know, it, it's hard. The, the saying it's hard to um, teach an old dog new tricks is absolutely true. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, and I, I understand and, and feel that with this podcast, with this platform, we are trying to get people to think differently. And it's been interesting in these conversations, sometimes it's really hard to step away from what is to imagine what could be, because yeah. we're just so stuck in the bureaucracy or just, you know, the roteness of what, you know, healthcare has become. So it is, uh, you have an interesting background that allows you to use skills 
that most people in healthcare probably don't have to help us think and switch perspectives. I absolutely love that. Would you take us on the journey of VBC1 and you know the impetus behind it, what you're trying to accomplish with this with this group? Absolutely. Um, so I had the good fortune to start in risk adjustment um, in the early days, and I would interact a lot with other areas. So working with medical directors on total cost of care projects to um, working with quality. And uh, in some of my roles, I found myself managing all of those programs and then just thinking, you know, and, and what I had found that it doesn't matter if you're a health plan, um, if you're a, a group that's offering technology to a health plan or to a medical group, right, that's assuming risk, um, you still need, um, you know, th there still is that need for that assistance of how do you bring what almost seems like disparate group, like disparate programs, right? Because you have risk adjustment over here, you have quality over here, total cost of care. How do you bring all of those things together so that you are effective and efficient? And I think that, you know, that can be really challenging, especially when you have at-risk medical groups that are trying to see patients, right? Mm -hmm. Health plans where there's still a lot of silos, you know, even though they know best practice is to see, you know, how can we uh, treat healthcare holistically? And so uh, recognizing that need, I was constantly being asked for, how can I talk to, you know, from vendors, how can I talk to a CFO? How can I talk to a CEO and, and get them to see that what we have, right, is, is going to help um, move the needle? Um, to, well, those patients, you know, they just don't want to be engaged. They don't pick up the phone uh, to hearing, you know, physicians, well, they just don't want to listen. Um, how can I get them to listen? And so um, I really thought that there was a need uh, between the three actors, health plans, mm -hmm. those medical groups, and those vendors um, to step in and, and really mine the gap. I mean, that's how I talk about it is how do you right. mine the gap in getting all the groups working together? It is, you know, in my consulting practice, we work on aligning people and the processes and enabling with technology. And it's it's always starts with the people part of that equation. And in the three spaces that you're playing with, it's the same thing, yes. right? Having individuals who understand what needs to be done and how to do it, and then working together to achieve the outcomes. Um, and as it's a simple equation conceptually, the actual lift is is huge, um, and I I love that you're tackling it with those three actors because all three of them have to work together for health care to exist. Talk to us about a little bit about why value based care is important in improving health care overall. Well, I think about, uh, and I know a lot of folks talk about the the triple aim and now the quadruple aim. And of course, we've evolved in the last year or so to the quintuple aim. You know, I think it, it really is about no longer being reactive, um, but being proactive. And we know, right? We know that there are statistics around when someone gets a, a diagnosis of diabetes, we know within three years, if they're not taking care of themselves, even if they are, more than likely they're going to have some impact, say, to their eyesight or some other system involvement. And, you know, we're going to quickly go from plain old vanilla diabetes to diabetes with complications. And the best way to thwart that journey, right, or knock it off course, slow things down, is to be proactive and to be preventative. And for so long, I think what we've always been chasing after um, in medicine is symptoms, right? Come and see me when you're sick. Let me think of the systems and then figure out how to solve things. And if we could just, you know, reverse that, turn it on its head, start at the beginning um, and really start to think about, uh, because that's the thing, you know, people are living longer. We know that, you know, 60% of our population, 65 and older, have at least one HCC or one, you know, one chronic condition. We know that 40% have at least two. And so, you know, we know these things. And I think to the extent that people are living longer um, and, but not necessarily healthier, if we can do something to, you know, make their lives better, make them more healthful, 
avoid some of these uh, more um, costly um, conditions, right? Uh, they're going to live healthier and happier lives. Absolutely. And I just came across the uh, statistic the other day that in 2030, all of our baby boomers will be legitimate 65-year-old senior citizens and older. That is a little mind blowing to me, right? When you just sort of all of a sudden put it into perspective. But then as we start talking about their care and the elder care needs for that population, we aren't prepared for it. No. And healthcare as a whole, and you, you described a little bit about this a moment ago, right? Is reactive. We, we go after the symptoms and we aren't preventative from the beginning. And that's, that's a huge change in the paradigm. You know, how, do we, how do we start to look into the future of that? And how, how do we start to make that paradigm shift? I, I think we really need to, you know, a lot of the programs that are out there and a lot of the things that value-based care stresses, right? Mm -hmm. So making sure that it, all the things that CMS and others have laid out for us, making sure that patients are getting in and seeing their physicians, we know that our seniors should be getting in and seeing their doctors. It will at least even those with chronic conditions five to eight times a year in order to manage their conditions. It's not the show up when you know you have nowhere else to go, but rather let's take care of things across the way. And so, getting your preventative screenings, you know, women getting in and getting their mammograms. Um, having, you know, uh, their um, A1C under control. Um, like I said, getting those diabetic retinopathy screenings. So doing all the preventative screenings that we know, I and mean, we know the statistics are out there that, you know, disease course is pretty predictable if mm -hmm. something isn't done. And we know when screenings need to occur. And so if we're doing all of this work, um, we, can, we can end up, you know, thwarting a lot of that or staving off um, those conditions getting worse. And I think the other thing too, you know, you had mentioned about us not being ready. You're absolutely right. Um, I saw similar statistics that said, you know, the largest percentage of the population is 65 and older. In fact, there are more, more seniors in this world um, and will continue to be so than there are those under the age of five. Um, and so, you know, I think then that looks at, that's another gap, right? And a disparity. And one of the things that we know too is that we have a shortage in this country of physicians. And so you have people living longer with more chronic conditions. How are you going to take care of them? And if you're not preventing them from getting sick to where they need that higher skill set, right, of a physician, um, we're going to be in trouble. You know, we've we've come to this cliff that I, I am fearful that we will fall off of should we not do something else. Right. And just to play with that thread a little bit more, right, as our population ages, we learned during the pandemic that assisted living in nursing facilities, there aren't enough of them. They aren't staffed adequately. Currently, they're starting to close because they don't have staffing. And that's you know a piece of this equation that we have to solve for. But in the care continuum, you know, the burden that falls and should fall to family we aren't prepared either. Our parents are divorced, so heaven forbid we deal with them together, it's not possible. And you have stepchildren in roles and it, it gets very confusing and the system as a whole still right, isn't designed to support it. With that, we are, are also seeing large health networks, hospital networks coming in and absorbing really anything that they can get their hands on. And so we have a greater disparity between those large systems and small independents. Yeah. What does that mean for the future from your perspective? You know, I, I really am a believer that both need to exist. Um, and okay. so maybe this is where, and I know folks are going to think I'm crazy, but um, this is where my experience as an educator, I taught history and English, by the way. Uh, but I, I think back to, you know, the cottage industry and the industrial revolution. And I think about what we did with schools, uh, even with um, with some of the movements that we had. Right. So when we uh, universalized things, created those huge verticals, um, we lost some things in the process. And so I think that, you know, you have these huge healthcare verticals. They're not getting it right either. There are people that are still not getting access to care. It, it's almost like you took a brush and you just wiped over 
right? The, um, the complexity of things. And we know that humans are complex. Health is complex. And so I think that there needs to always be a space for that independent doc. And similar to what I saw happen in schools would say like the charter school movement, um, you know, in, in that kind of um, uh, change of letting the public take hold um, and more of that, you know, independence foster. Um, I think that we need, we're going to see the same thing with our physicians. And I think a lot of the movement um, has been towards that. I mean, look at the new REACH programs, some of the other new legislation that's allowing medical groups um, to contract directly, um, right, with, with CMS and with the governing bodies um, and being able to offer their own plans. So I don't think everybody thinks that verticals are where it's at. I think that they serve a purpose, maybe for the healthier in our society, um, but not necessarily uh, for everyone. And um, just to go back, you know, to your comment about the the change in the family, absolutely agree. And, and that's why I mentioned, you know, the, the cottage industry. Right. Um, I think that we're going to have a reversal um, going back to something similar um, in healthcare. What exactly it'll look like, I don't know. I don't think we've seen it yet, um, but I, I do think that, uh, you know, being broad and these broad strokes of which we apply um, to things is not um, is not going to solve for everything. I think that, uh, you know, we're far too, far too down the road of knowledge, right, and specialization um, mm -hmm. that we, you know, we need, we need that, that those specialties uh, like that. I respect that you have the ability to see the need for the large, right? The hospital system and respect for the, you know, the independent primary care or the direct primary care model, however we want to talk about that, because they all add value to the patient experience, right? Right. And in a catastrophic situation, do we want access to a trauma one facility? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Do I enjoy having my primary care physician come to my home? Oh, yes, I do. Right. So these are those two <laughs> polar extremes, but we need them both. And in many conversations, you people get tied to where they play in that spectrum. And I really respect that you see the whole of that continuum and that there's a place for all of it that adds value. I, and I love tying everything back to, you know, that patient centric value of it. We've talked a little bit about some of the, the challenges and the nuances around things, but really looking forward, you are excited about the future. And what are some of the hopes that you have? What are the things on the horizon that, that, you know, give you room for that encouragement? I think that, uh, you know, just the conversations that we're having um, folks are more active. You know, I see patients um, being empowered and involved in their care. And I think that's huge, right? Because they're getting to decide uh, how their care takes place on their terms to a certain degree. I know that there are still, you know, barriers that need to be broken down. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, uh, they have more power in their voice um, than they ever have before. I think physicians too, wanting to look at medicine differently, I think is invigorating. Um, you know, just talking to physician friends of mine, you know, having patients come in that are ill, feeling like they can't help them, right? Um, feeling that burden and beat down. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think now with the focus on preventative care, really feeling like they're making a difference. I know when I'm having those conversations with them, you know, those are the things that they, you know, um, perk up to, if you will, and, uh, you know, um, feel invigorated again. You know, it's exciting to practice medicine because you feel like, again, you know, you can get ahead of that wave, if you will, um, and focus on being, um, you know, proactive as opposed to reactive. And I know over the last few years, you've done some, you've done work in, in the telemedicine space. Yes. And obviously, the past couple of years really let that rocket take off and it, it needed to and it was you know it was hovering out there on the horizon and and one of the i guess positives of a pandemic right we were forced out of our comfort zone where do you see telemedicine really sitting in the future um i definitely see that being part of part of what we're doing you know i had mentioned that um, we have a shortage of physicians mm -hmm. in this country um, we have a shortage of nurses people retiring 
And so we need to find ways to balance uh, the workload um, and everything else that we're asking them to do. And I think telemedicine is a great way to do that. It removes barriers. You know, you think about it, you could go in and, and see your PA or your NP. Uh, you can have your, your clinical care team. I mean, it even goes beyond, right? Um, the, you know, the physician or the nurse, you can bring in others that are important to that whole, um, you know, portrait of care uh, to be able to comment and just the access and even for patients. You know, um, when we started telehealth, there were a few things that I heard. Uh, some people said, oh, they'll never come. And at that time, you know, the world was shut down and I was in an area that was very restrictive. And we had patients, you know, over the age of 65, uh, getting on camera, getting their hair done, inviting their family, they really saw it as a social opportunity. And so I thought it was great that we could provide that outlet to them. Um, but also, too, we saw patients that we were never seeing. There were people that prior to the pandemic wouldn't go out of their homes or it was too hard to travel or they were caring for a loved one in the home. Or, you know, we think about um, populations where, you know, taking off of work right, is really a challenge, uh, taking the, their children out of school or what have you. And so I think it just provides um, an additional modality. I know I talked to physicians. I had ones near retirement that said to me, I'm not going to retire. Um, I love this telehealth stuff. I'm coming back in it, you know, because it just, again, it, it just alleviated in different ways. And it might not work for everybody, um, but I think for, for some folks, it definitely provides an option. And we actually did a pilot study uh, and looked at what we could capture. And that's not to say that you don't ever go into your physician again and that you don't have someone lay hands on you, uh, but you don't need to practice medicine like that all the time. Uh, so checking in either through a video you know, um, uh, session or even by phone, right, could be enough and, uh, and get folks the care that they need. Um, so I definitely see that being a part of our future. And I love the part of the story with the physicians who are on the cusp of retiring saying, no, I don't need to. Right. And so it starts to give us layers of, you know, we can have our PAs and our NPs, and then we can have experienced physicians supporting more people and giving quality of care because you have the escalation access when necessary. Um, you know, that's a, a, a tech support model but it's Absolutely. a really effective one. Yes. Right. And do some triage and, you know, and work through it and have qualified, highly experienced physicians for the, the difficult questions, the stuff that isn't quite making sense. Um, I, I love that look for the future. And I think it then too starts to demand, um, you know, a better quality of care. You have access then to specialists that might be in the cities, right? That you never had access to. Uh, so I think it just opens up so much and breaks down so many barriers. Um, even with, you know, with telehealth, uh, they had allowed for the um, the laxing of license requirements, right, across states. Um, so where someone in California could see a patient in New York, and I think that you know even those things are very important because. Again, when we look at where the shortage is of physicians, it's not typically in your major metro areas. You know, it's more of those rural communities, and that's the majority of our country. And so how are we going to be able to provide care? We have a shortage of physicians, um, but again, like I said, the, the dearth, right, um, yeah. is not, not specific or it's not widespread or evenly spread across the country. And so how are you going to provide care to some of those more remote areas? Yeah, and, and those remote areas are underserved also in the size and the quality of the hospitals that are, are serving the patients, right? It extrapolates out, but if you have access via telehealth to the the doctors with the right ideas, right, we're starting to close gaps, right. and, and that is really important. This is a fabulous conversation, Shannon. I am so, so grateful to have you here with me today. I have one final, final question, and it is, my question for everybody, if I gave you a magic wand, how would you use it to change the healthcare industry? Um, huge question. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'd be wa waving it pretty widely. Um, but uh, I think that uh, 
you know, I, I think I would want to continue a lot of the changes that we're seeing as far as um, permitting, you know, other, um, other professionals uh, within this space um, to be able to see patients and administer care. Um, I think it would be to continue telehealth. I think it would be to continue to allow provider groups to disrupt those healthcare verticals to provide another option, um, you know, to patients and in and, and to the world. Um, the other thing, though, I think that we need to focus on uh, is on mental health. And I think we don't give enough credence to, you know, just like we've brought a lot of the pieces together, we need to continue to do that and meld together what we see in the physiologic space um, with that in the mental health space too. Because we know that a lot of the reasons why people are going to the primary care physicians, I think I saw the other day a statistic, it was like 75 to 90% of all PCP visits um, are usually related to some stress or mental health um, challenge. And we certainly do not have enough mental health providers. And so I think to, to continue to forge forward to truly treat the patient holistically, um, we need to, you know, we need to shore up in that area um, to be able to support our patients in that way as well. Wow. So with your magic wand, you took three swipes. And so <laughs> I love it. I, right? I dream big and, and we're hitting on, on multiple levels. And I, I truly appreciate that. And, you know, the thing is, I ask this question, I originally thought that people were going to come back with, you know, some of those easy answers, like, you know, a cure for cancer. Yeah. And none of it is related to that in any way, shape or form, not a single person. Everybody wants to talk about education, about access to care. Um, I love the statement, right? Provider groups being able to disrupt and provide more services. I think that's fantastic. And of course, mental health, which you and I could have probably a whole nother show on that topic alone. Um, but I think that it's important with everything that we've talked about today that you included it in because it is, it is hugely impactful. And the statistic of 75 to 90% of PCP visits being related to mental health issues is staggering. Yes, absolutely. It is absolutely. I, I, I was, I'm stumbling over words because I had not heard those numbers and I'm, I'm saddened that that's where we're at as a population, but it also makes perfect sense to me. Shannon, I so appreciate you giving me some of your time today. This has been a fabulous conversation. Um, our viewers and our listeners would love to know the easiest way to, to find you on, on, on LinkedIn. Is there a place where we can send them if they want to learn more? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you can find me at uh, VBC1. Uh, we have a LinkedIn page. Uh, you can find me also under Shannon Decker uh, and then also by visiting VBC1.com. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you for the conversation. And that wraps up today's edition of Break Everything in Healthcare. You have just experienced Break Everything with Lisa L. Levy. Critical conversations on direct and disruption that makes a difference.